let's talk about Atomic Habits chapter number eight. So if you have been following along, we're talking about, we're just actually starting the second law, which is all about making it attractive. This is a concept of like trying to break down why we do what we do, why we can't stop um, certain things we'd like to change, right? Because they're habits and we're trying to figure out how to rewire the brain so we can overcome those things and form better, new, healthier habits, right? Things that we would rather be doing. So if you're following along, we're on page 101. Uh, chapter eight is all about how to make it irresistible. The habits, irresistible. So he starts by sharing two different stories. I like stories and things that help me kind of get a visual um, of something like a concept that we're gonna talk about. And so this one's um, interesting, they're both about birds. He talks about a Dutch scientist that does an experiment on adult herring gulls. And he says that they have like a little red dot on their beak and the baby chicks and the nest will go up and they'll peck that little exact dot and that's how the parents know that they need to eat. And so he created a collection of fake cardboard beaks, just a head with no body, obviously very fake. And he offered these dummy beaks to the birds. And he assumed the birds would reject them all together because there was nothing about them that was real. But he said that the tiny gulls saw the red spot on the cardboard beak and they pecked away just as if they were attached to their own mother. They had a clear preference for those red spots as if they had been genetically programmed at birth. Soon he discovered that the bigger the spot, the faster the chicks pecked. Eventually he created a beak with three large red dots on it and we placed it over the nest. The baby birds went crazy. They pecked the little red patches as if it was the greatest beak they had ever seen. And then he talks about another one with a gray lag goose, which is a ground nestling bird. And he says occasionally the mother moves around the nest and one of the eggs would roll out and away. And it would immediately go over, clutch it, however it gets it back into the nest over and over again. So they discovered that the goose would pull any sort of round object back up into the nest. Um, they tried, I mean, everything. The greater the object, the greater the, like I should say, the bigger the object, the greater the response. Um, they tried a billiard ball, they tried a light bulb, and the, the goose like literally brought every one of those back into the nest. And the biggest one they did was a volleyball, and it took it back into the nest, just as if it was one of its eggs. Um, like the baby gulls automatically pecking the red dots, the gray lag goose was following an instinctive rule. When I see a round object nearby, I must roll it back into the nest. The bigger the round object, the harder I should try to get it. So it's like the brain of each animal is preloaded with certain rules for behavior. And when it comes across an exaggerated version of that rule, it lights up like a Christmas tree. Scientists refer to these exaggerated cues as supernormal stimuli. And that's a heightened version of reality, like a beak with three red dots or an egg the size of a volleyball, and it elicits a stronger response than usual. So we'll see where we're going with this. Humans are also prone to fall for exaggerated versions of reality. And that talks about junk food, for example, drives our reward systems into a frenzy. Um, have any, if you've any of you have been around small children, I take that back. Any size of a child under the age 18, because my teenagers do this. If I open a bag of chips, it is like they swarm from every corner of the house. I don't know how they hear it. They can't smell it. Like I have to hide in my pantry behind me and close the door. It's just like, there's always a response. And it's specifically with junk food. If I pull out a bag of spinach, I don't get the same response. And so it drives the reward systems into a frenzy and they all come running and I say, leave me alone. I wanna eat my chips in peace. Um, so we're gonna go into food, right? And because I think, you know, think of how many times you walk through a grocery store and you're not hungry, you're not craving anything. And then certain things appeal to you and all of a sudden you want them. So a primary goal of food science is to create products that are more attractive to consumers. Nearly every food in a bag, box, or jar has been enhanced in some way, if only with additional flavoring. Companies spend millions of dollars to discover the most satisfying level of a crunch in a potato chip or the perfect amount of fizz in a soda. Entire departments are dedicated to optimizing how a product feels in your mouth, a quality known as oro sensation. French fries, for example, are a potent combination. I love fries. Golden brown and crunchy on the outside, light and smooth on the inside. Definitely McDonald's though. Everyone has their preference. Other processed foods enhance dynamic contrast, which refers to items with a combination of sensations, like maybe crunchy and creamy. So this would be a dynamic contrast. And they're very aware of what they're doing because these appeal uh, without any control for a lot of people. Imagine the gooiness of melted cheese on top of a crispy 
uh, pizza crust or the crunch of an Oreo cookie combined with its smooth center. With natural unprocessed foods, you tend to experience the same sensations over and over. How's that the 17th bite of kale taste, right? Same thing over and over. After a few minutes, your brain loses interest and you begin to feel full. But foods that are high in dynamic contrast keep the experience novel and interesting, encouraging you to eat more. So just like he said, compare eating kale versus Snickers bar, right? There's definitely a different response in your brain. Ultimately, such strategies enable food scientists to find the bliss point for each product, the precise combination of salt, sugar, and fat that excites your brain and keeps you coming back for more. The result, of course, is that you overeat because hyperpalpable foods are more attractive to the human brain. Would you guys agree? Um, a neuroscience who specializes in eating behaviors and obesity says we've gotten too good at pushing our own buttons. So the modern food industry and the overeating habits it has spawned is just one example of the second law of the behavior change, which is make it attractive. The more attractive an opportunity is, the more likely it is to become habit forming. Look around, societies filled with highly engineered versions of reality that are more attractive than the world our ancestors evolved in. Stores feature mannequins with exaggerated hips um, to sell clothes. Social media delivers more likes and praise in a few minutes than we could ever get in the office or at home. Advertisements are created with a combination of ideal lighting, professional makeup, photoshopped edits. Even the model doesn't look like the person in the final image. That's like all of Instagram, I feel like. These are the supernormal stimuli of our modern world. They exaggerate features that are naturally attractive to us and our instincts go wild as a result, driving us into excessive shopping habits, social media habits, eating habits, and many other ones. So as if history serves as a guide, the opportunities of the future will be more attractive than those of today. The trend is for rewards to become more concentrated and stimuli to become more enticing. Junk food is more concentrated form of calories than natural foods. Hard liquor is more of a concentrated form of alcohol than beer. Video games are more concentrated form of play than board games. And compared to nature, these pleasure packed experiences are hard to resist. And we have the brains of our ancestors, but temptations they never had to face. Cause he's talked about a little bit, um, our ancestors from like thousands of years ago. Um, and how they didn't, they didn't have any of this, right? It was, it's very different. Uh, there's no prepackaged things that rewire your brain and wanting them. If you want to increase the odds that a behavior will occur, then you need to make it attractive. Throughout our discussion on the second law, our goal is to learn how to make our habits irresistible. While it is not possible to transform every habit into a supernormal stimulus, we can make any habit more enticing. And to do this, we must start by understanding what a craving is and how it works. So hopefully you guys will feel um, like this is relatable. I, I think most of us have cravings for certain things. And there's a little things that will tip you off. We've talked about these in the last chapters. You know, I won't be wanting anything and I'll smell something or I'll see a, I'll see somewhere where I'm used to eating, you know, a certain item and then immediately thinks because of the association, oh, I want that now. And then you crave it and you cannot stop thinking about it. Um, so let's begin by examining a biological signature that all habits share, which is a dopamine spike. Scientists can track the precise moment a craving occurs by measuring a neurotransmitter called dopamine. The importance of dopamine became apparent in 1954 when the neuroscientists, these two guys, ran an experiment that revealed the neurological processes behind craving and desire. By implanting electrodes in the brains of rats, the researchers blocked the release of dopamine. To the surprise of the scientists, the rats lost all will to live because their dopamine was blocked. They wouldn't eat, they wouldn't have sex, they didn't crave anything, and within a few days, the animals died of thirst. In a follow-up study, the other scientists also inhibited the dopamine-releasing parts of the brain, but this time they squirted little droplets of sugar onto the mouth of the dopamine-depleted rats. Their little rat faces lit up with pleasurable grins from the tasty substance. Even though dopamine was blocked, they liked the sugar just as much as before. They just didn't want it anymore. The ability to experience pleasure remained, but without dopamine, desire died. And without desire, the action stopped. So when we go back, let's read that. So with the rats, right, they blocked the release of dopamine entirely. And they lost the will to do everything, to include sex, which I didn't think, I don't want to think about with rats. But that says a lot. There's nothing. They didn't crave anything. We'll just leave it at that. In a follow-up study, though, they blocked the dopamine, but they still squirted little droplets of sugar, right? Which can release the same thing in our heads, in our brains. And so they lit up because the pleasure was there, but the dopamine that followed up that pleasure was blocked. So then they didn't want the action anymore. They were okay with not having the sugar. Um, when other researchers reversed this process and then flooded the reward system of the brain with dopamine again, the animals preferred um, habits at breakneck speed. 
or excuse me, the animals performed habits at breakneck speed. In one study, mice received a powerful hit of dopamine each time they poked their nose in a box. Within minutes, the mice developed a craving so strong they began poking their nose into the box about 800 times per hour. Uh, humans are not so different. The average slot machine player will spin the wheel 600 times per hour. So this one is interesting. So they did the opposite where they flooded the reward system with dopamine. And it, it like, I mean, if anyone has had hyper kids, you know what I'm talking about, right? From too much sugar, they, they don't calm down. So they received a powerful hit of dopamine whenever they poked their nose in a box. So they did it 800 times an hour. Habits are a dopamine-driven feedback loop. Every behavior that is highly habit-forming like, I guess, taking drugs, he gives, uh, eating junk food, playing video games, browsing social media. Like, I find there's times where I'll, I'll be a, just doing whatever, and I actually have a craving to get on social media. It's like I, the thought keeps coming back, like I want to scroll or I want to see what's going on. I'm like, I don't really want to do that, but it keeps coming back to me. So if you guys have had certain behaviors or like that, maybe you enjoy reading or it's a certain hobby or whatever it is that you do. And um, all those things is associated with a higher level of dopamine. The same can be said for our most basic habitual behaviors like eating food, drinking water, having sex, and interacting socially. For years, scientists assumed dopamine was all about pleasure, but now we know it plays a central role in many neurological processes, including motivation, learning, and memory, punishment, aversion, and even voluntary movement. When it comes to habits, the key takeaway is this, that dopamine is released not only when you experience pleasure, but also when you anticipate it. Um, gambling addicts have a dopamine spike right before they place a bet, not after they win. These are, these are not some relatable examples. Cocaine addicts get a surge of dopamine when they see the powder, not after they take it. Whenever you predict that opportunity will be rewarding, your levels of dopamine spike in anticipation. Um, and whenever dopamine rises, so does your motivation to act. But it is the anticipation of a reward, not the actual fulfillment of it, that gets us to take action. So instead of crack cocaine, let's talk about maybe cookies. If you see a plate of cookies on the counter, sometimes it's the anticipation of eating them. I've had, had one in a while. You get that craving for it and you can smell it. You can taste it, right? You're anticipating it. And when you eat it and it's like, oh, it's okay, but it's that anticipation right before. That's what gets us to take the action and want it. Interestingly, the reward system that is activated in the brain when you receive a reward is the same system that is activated when you anticipate a reward. This is one reason the anticipation of an experience can often feel better than the attaining of it. So as a child, thinking about Christmas morning can be better than actually opening the gifts. As an adult, daydreaming about an upcoming vacation can be more enjoyable than actually being on vacation. It's that anticipation, the rush that you get from thinking about those things. And scientists refer to this as the difference between wanting and liking. So again, you know, pause for a minute and think of certain things in your life where you can relate to some of this. Um, before a habit is learned, dopamine is released when the reward is experienced for the first time. The next time around, dopamine rises before taking action. So interesting, the first time is released when it's experienced for the first time. So let's say you go by to eat a cookie and once you eat it, that's when you get the dopamine release because you don't know what to anticipate before that. But then after that, the dopamine rises before the action because you're anticipating because you remember how good it tastes. This spike leads to a feeling of desire and a craving to take action whenever the cue is spotted. Once a habit is learned, dopamine will not rise when a reward is experienced because you already expect the reward. However, if you, however, if you see a cue and expect a reward but do not get one, then dopamine will drop in disappointment. The sensitivity of the dopamine response can clearly be seen when a reward is provided late. First, the cue is identified and dopamine rises as a craving builds. Next, a response is taken, but the reward does not come as quickly as expected and dopamine begins to drop. Finally, when the reward comes a little later than you'd hoped, the dopamine spikes again, as if the brain was saying, see, I knew I was right. Don't forget to repeat the action next time. So your brain has far more neural circuitry allocated for wanting rewards than for actually liking them. Isn't that crazy? From actually like taking action and actually eating the cookie, it's more of the anticipation of eating it. The wanting centers in the brain are large. The brain stem, the nucleus, acumens, the ventral tegmental area, the dorsal striatum, and the amyg amygdala. I remember that in school. I don't remember how to say it. You get it. The portions of the prefrontal cortex. By comparison, the liking centers of the brain are much smaller. They're also referred to as hedon hedon hedonotic, hedonic, whatever it is, hot spots. They're just hot spots. That's all we'll say. They are distrib uh, distributed like tiny islands throughout the brain. For instance, researchers have found that 100% of the nucleus acubens is activated during wanting. Meanwhile, only 10% of the structure is activated during liking. The fact that the brain allocates so much precious space to the regions responsible for craving and desire provides further evidence of the crucial role the processes play. 
A desire is the engine that drives behavior. Every action is taken because of the anticipation that precedes it. It is the craving that leads to the response. So that's something I hadn't really thought about. Like I know anticipation. I'm always excited about something. If I'm going to look forward to eating a really good meal or if I have a treat meal, like a something sort of treat that I want after my last meal, I really do anticipate it. And these insights reveal the importance of the second law of behavior change, right? Make it attractive. We need to make our habits attractive because the expectation of the rewarding experience that motivates us to act in the first place. And this is where a strategy known as temptation bundling comes into play. So sorry, some of this is a little more sciencey, so it's a little more reading than usual. Um, and we're almost through. So then the question is, how to use temptation bundling to make your habits more attractive, ones that you want to have? <clears throat> Um, an, an, electrical, an electrical engineering student in Dublin, Ireland enjoyed watching Netflix, but he also knew he should exercise more often than he did. So putting his engineering skills to use, he hacked his stationary bike and connected it to his laptop and television. And then he wrote a computer program that would allow Netflix to run only <laughs> if he was cycling at a certain speed. This is something that we could all use. If he slowed down for too long, because he like stopped paying attention, he started watching the TV more. Uh, whatever show he was watching would pause until he started pedaling again. And it was in the words of one person, eliminating obesity, one Netflix binge at a time. Can you imagine that? Like to be able to, to get that pleasure, that craving of watching a show that you want, you actually, <laughs> it's tied to exercise. He was also employing temptation bundling to make his exercise habits more attractive. Temptation bundling works by linking an action that you want to do to an action that you need to do. So wants to do is watching TV, which I'm sure we all spend some time doing at some point in the week. And, but then there's actions that we need to do like exercising. So in this case, he bundled watching Netflix, the thing that he wanted with riding his stationary bike, which is the thing he needed. Businesses are masters at temptation bundling. For instance, when the American Broadcasting Company or it's ABC launched its Thursday night, Thursday night television lineup, they promoted temptation bundling on a massive scale. Every Thursday, the company would air three shows. I don't know if you guys remember these, Grey's Anatomy, um, Scandal, and How to Get Away with Murder. They branded it, thank gosh, it's Thursday on ABC. Uh, in addition to promoting the shows, they encouraged viewers to make popcorn, drink red wine, and enjoy the evening. Um, he described the idea behind the campaign is, we see Thursday night as a viewership opportunity with other couples or women by themselves who want to sit down and escape and have fun and drink their red wine and enjoy some popcorn. And uh, the brilliance of this strategy is that ABC was associating the thing that they needed viewers to do, which is watch their show, with activities their viewers already wanted to do, which is relax, drink wine, and eat popcorn. So you've got a need, they needed them to do this, they tied it with something that they wanted to do. Over time, people began to connect watching ABC with feeling relaxed and entertained. And if you drink red wine and eat popcorn at 8 p.m. every Thursday, then eventually 8 p.m. on Thursday means relaxation and entertainment because they're tied. The reward gets associated with the cue and the habit of turning on the television becomes more attractive because you associate it with being um, relaxed, right? And being able to enjoy your, their treats that you'd like. You're more likely to find a behavior attractive if you get to do one of your favorite things at the same time and you tie them together. So perhaps you want to hear about the latest celebrity gossip, but you also need to get in shape. Using temptation bundling, you can read the tabloids only while watching uh, or re-watching reality shows at the gym. So you don't go do them anywhere else. You do them only tied to something that you should do, need to do, which is at the gym. Maybe you want to get a pedicure, but you need to clean your email inbox out. Solution, only get a pedicure while processing overwork overdue work emails, right? So you've got the need and the want and you're tying them together where they only happen maybe during this time. Um, temptation bundling is one way to apply a psychology theory um, named after the work of a professor. He states that the more probable behaviors will reinforce less probable behaviors. In other words, if you don't really want to process overdue work emails, which nobody does, you'll become conditioned to do it if it means you get to do something you really want to do along with it, like when you're getting your nails done. And you can combine these, um, which is with the stacking strategy. And I've remembered in chapter five, we have the stacking strategy. And so um, let's give us a couple examples. So you're going to combine habit stacking plus the temptation bundling that we just talked about. What does that mean? That means um, the theory for this is after I do a current, or I perform a current habit, I will then do another habit that I need to do. And that was the habit stacking we talked about before, right? So I, I want, I need to drink water. That's something I want to be better at. Well, I'm really good at brushing my teeth, which is a current habit. And so then I'm going to stack it with a habit that I'm not very good at, which is drinking water. So you take a habit you're good at brushing teeth right afterwards, take a habit you're not good at, but want to be better at, which is drinking your water. And so then after you drink the water, which is the habit I need, I will then read a book, something that I want to do. 
So if you want to read the news, but you need to express more gratitude, then you can do this. For instance, after I get my morning coffee, I will say one thing I'm grateful for that happened yesterday. Um, and after I say one thing I'm grateful for, I'll read the news. So you've got a need and a want. So you've got the habit. He's always, he, she's always good at getting morning coffee. That's a habit. No problem there. Then you say thing that is something that you want to work on. Just like we had the, the drink more water. This is, well, I want to be grateful. I want to mention something I'm grateful for. That's the need. That's the habit I'm trying to work on. So I'm good at drinking coffee. That's a current habit. I'm working on the need of wanting to be more grateful. That's the habit I'm working on. And then after that, after you say the one thing you're grateful for, then you're going to read the news, which is what you want, right? So you've got a habit that you're good at, a habit that you need to do, and then a habit that you want to do. And that's the reward is watching the news because you said something you're grateful for. Um, if you want to watch sports, but you need to make a sales call first, how does this work? After I get back from my lunch break, a habit that you're used to doing, I will call three potential clients, which is the need, right? That's something you're supposed to be working on. So you take habit, easy to go to lunch with the hard habit, making three phone calls. Then you get the reward, which is after I call three calls, three potential calls, I will then get to check ESPN, which is the want. So you're stacking all three of these things. Another one, if you want to check Facebook, but you need to exercise more, after I pull out my phone, I will do 10 burpees. And after I do 10 burpees, I will check Facebook. So you got, after you pull out your phone, which is easy to do, that's a habit you got. Then you work on the habit you need to work on, which is I'll get my 10 burpees done. And then the reward is something that you want to do that's kind of a pleasurable thing, which is being able to check Facebook. The hope is that eventually you look forward to calling three clients or doing 10 burpees because it means you get to read the latest sports news or check Facebook. Doing the thing you need to do means you get to do the thing that you want to do. So see how that all leads together. It's not just, I'm going to go do 10 burpees out of nowhere. Nope. Stack those 10 burpees after every single day. I have it. You're already really good at. Then the reward for doing those 10 burpees is something you really want to do. This is like something we need to teach kids. We begin this chapter by discussing supernormal stimuli which with the, the rats, which are heightened versions of reality that increase our desire to take action. Temptation bundling is one way to create a heightened version of any habit by connecting it with something you already want. So engineering a truly irresistible habit is a hard task, but the simple strategy can be employed to make nearly any habit more attractive than it would otherwise be. So no one wants to do 10 burpees, but burpees suck. But it becomes more attractive because then you know you get something that you want afterwards. And you're more likely to do it because you paired it directly after something that you do every day, which is pulling out your phone at a certain time of day. So hopefully that helps a little bit to be able to think about how that temptation is, the anticipation of it, how the dopamine works in our you know, in our brains. So we get that craving, why we can't get rid of those cravings, which is why we can't get rid of a lot of our habits. And so one way is to make it attractive, right? Doing 10 burpees is now attractive because you get something you want afterwards. So hopefully that helps. Um, you know, each of these, this one's a little bit more technical. It's a little more reading, sorry. Um, he always just says it way better than I do. Um, and helping us to understand why we cannot put the cookie down, right? Why it's irresistible. And I think the more we understand this and then can remedy it throughout the day of doing, you know, healthier habits that we want, um, you'll feel better. So hopefully that helps. And then we'll talk about the next chapter next week.